Peace of the Lord be with you. And uh, today is Monday, May 18th, and apparently Monday is the day where I'm tending towards getting the uh, the devotions out a little bit later. So um, in view of that, we will follow the order of early evening again, and um, we will uh, have our for our reading today. This is uh, this is the week of the Ascension, uh, so I'll actually be doing. Uh, two sets of, of, of devotions, um, kind of going through eight readings. Um, since we've got the you know the two the two occasions, we've got we've got the Ascension on Thursday and then uh, the seventh Sunday of Easter on Sunday. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do though is um, I'll, I'll be doing the four readings for the Ascension individually, and then I'll combine two of the readings for for Sunday together and uh, two of the the other two readings for Sunday together. So I will actually have devotions for, for every day this week, for Monday through Saturday, so um, that, that's a bonus there. Um, but, uh, but other than that, um, our, our first reading for this week, which is, is a little bit unusual, will be the, uh, the, the first reading, the reading from Acts. Usually I begin with the Gospel so that we can kind of filter things for the week through that reading. Uh, you know, the Gospel usually sort of is the, 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 the focus and um, is the, the theme for the week. With the Ascension, though, it's a little bit different. So we're we're looking at the at the Ascension in Acts. Um, the Ascension we also see in Luke, but uh, but Acts has a little bit more a little bit more detail about it. So we're going to read that and uh, and and just kind of as a note, a part of the reason why we also usually have the gospel lesson sort of as the central central piece of the of the, the service on Sunday and that sort of thing is because that's where we have the words of Jesus Himself. Well, in the lesson from Acts this morning. In uh, something that's kind of unusual, we have Jesus' own words outside of the four Gospels. So that's uh, another part of the part of the reason why we'll start with the start with the the, the first reading, the, the reading from Acts today. So that being said, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, joyous light of glory of the immortal Father. Heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Amen. So we're reading Acts, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let us pray. Blessed Lord Jesus, as you ascended into heaven... As you sit at the right hand of the Father, we give you thanks that you sit in that place of authority in your mercy, that you rule over us in your church by your grace, that you proclaim to us the forgiveness of our sins through your called servants, through the witnesses that you have sent. And we pray that as we are here before you in your word and hearing the witness of the apostles as we have those witnesses recorded in the New Testament, that you would uh, bless us with your Holy Spirit, that we would hear that word, that we would understand that word, that we would grasp it with the depths of our heart, knowing of your great love for us. We ask these in all things as you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Well, as we uh, dive into to the words of this passage, we start off with, with Luke. Now, if you, if you aren't familiar with the book of Acts, it's, uh, it's a book that was written by, by Luke, the same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in fact, a lot of times in modern-day biblical scholarship, they speak of, of these two books together, calling them Luke-Acts. And that's why, why Luke says that at the beginning. He says, in the first book, so he's referencing his gospel there, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given command through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And we'll read that passage tomorrow. That's the end of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we see, of course, he said, I, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So we have, you know, the whole Gospel of Luke where we have his birth. We have a miraculous birth, of course, uh, to, to the Virgin Mary. We have his his life. Uh, we, the Gospel of Luke is the only Gospel that has, for example, Jesus in the in the temple at age of 12. Uh, we have his ministry in, in, in Luke. Uh, many of the things we have in Luke we have elsewhere as well, but I have that that ministry, and then we have uh, we have his life. Luke also has the most extensive uh, telling of the the events after the resurrection of Jesus. So so that's a part of it, and, and included in that is the what he says there until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. We'll talk about the, those commands tomorrow, what that means, but uh, we but that. Just to make note that this is in reference to to the Gospel of Luke, and as we see hear him, he's writing to Theophilus both in that Gospel and in this book. Um, we don't know for sure who Theophilus was, uh, or if Theophilus was actually a person. Some think that this is just Theophilus means lover of God. So there's some who think that perhaps this was just a, a name that whoever would read it could could know it. Um, many others, and I probably am inclined to to say that I would be among those think that uh, that Theophilus was someone in the church who had had commissioned Luke actually to write somebody who could could uh, could sort of commission that that writing um, but we continue uh, so verse three uh, he presented himself alive uh, excuse me just a second let me make sure that I've got yeah he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God so here Jesus, they're talking about Jesus' resurrection, right? He presented himself alive after suffering by many proofs. And, and as we, we see those proofs, uh, one of the things I can think of is, is 1 Corinthians 15. If you ever read 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes note there of all the, uh, of all the appearances that Jesus makes to people. Now, as I say that, we have other appearances that are, are documented elsewhere. The Gospel of John has a number of appearances of, of Jesus as, after the resurrection, um, the, the, the miraculous catch of fish after the resurrection, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got the, the, the proofs that, that Luke himself already discussed in, in the Gospel of Luke. Um, but as we, we think about all of this, you know, this is the center, the heart of the Christian faith, is this resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The, the fact that he died on Good Friday for our sins and was raised to get a t raised again on Easter, attesting to that fact that our sin is forgiven. That's, uh, that's the heart of the faith. In fact, we, as we look at the, the New Testament, and look at the evidence not only within the New Testament itself, but surrounding the New Testament as a whole, uh, you find that this resurrection is actually very trustworthy. And in fact, as we, we deal with that historically, I think it's one of the, the, the best arguments we have for the Christian faith is to say, look look at the evidence for the writing of the New Testament, look at the evidence of, of its reliability within that. Manuscript evidence for the New Testament is far beyond any other historical work that we have. You know, it's more reliable than any other, more reliable than Plato, more reliable than Homer, um, more reliable than, than any other historical work that we have. And it speaks of this resurrection of Jesus, these, these proofs that Jesus did rise from the dead. And that resurrection from the dead is important. People don't just rise from the dead on their own, right? So, um, continuing on, after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples for 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. And it makes sense. He was with them for 40 days, and the ascension that we're hearing about happened. Um, that's why the ascension is this week. It's 40 days after Easter. Uh, and then while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. That promise of the Father there is that, so Jesus, just to clarify, Jesus is telling them, wait in Jerusalem, wait in the city until you receive this promise. That promise is the Holy Spirit. And um, we 
talked about that a couple of weeks ago, the promise in John of that Holy Spirit. To get again that, that promise spoken of at the, the end of Acts. Um, this is this is the promise that when Jesus goes, you know, John it says that John uh, John 16, if if I if I go, I will not leave you as, as orphans. Or if I go, it's better for you. That's what he, in 16 is better for you that I go because then I can send the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the one who gives you that faith, the one who strengthens you and who is with you. And then he says, clarifying that that understanding all the more. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. We know that that baptism of the Holy Spirit, as is, is Jesus is calling it there, uh, is is in chapter 2 of Acts. It's at Pentecost, 10 days after after the resurrection, or excuse me, after the ascension. Uh, so Jesus sends the, or Jesus ascends, 10 days later he sends the Holy Spirit. And as we hear that the, the, uh, John baptized with water, we see John the Baptist baptizing Jesus himself even in water. Um, we should be clear to understand that when, when he says this, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, that that does not mean that Christian baptism does not include water or true baptism does not include water. Uh, we see right away in Acts that they, that they always baptize with water. Uh, we see it on the day of Pentecost. And, and if we would wonder if that actually included water, in, in, in Acts chapter 8, you have Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. Here he, he, he uh, speaks the, the word of God to, to the eunuch, and, and then the eunuch says, what precludes me from being baptized? Here is some water, right? So we want to understand that that, that water baptism is not something that is, is in and of itself separate from this baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they go, they go hand in hand together. Continuing, so then when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know times or seasons, but that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Um, there we have this, this a common understanding that we see throughout the, the Gospels and, and the New Testament that there's just going to be this restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And, you know, that harkens back to, to the kingdom of David, the kingdom of Solomon, right? Um, in those kingdoms, Israel was sort of in its, its earthly glory. Uh, you know, it was independent. It, it was um, very blessed by God materially. It was, it was a kingdom where the people could worship the Lord freely. And they want that restoration. But, but if we recall what Jesus says in his trial when he's speaking to Pontius Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's what the, I think part of the realization with the coming of the Holy Spirit is that this kingdom isn't finally realized now. You know, we always want this kingdom realized now. We want the we want the fullness of the glories of heaven now. We want the the peace of heaven now. We want the comfort and and the the, the happiness of heaven now. And and all those things aren't promised to us. The promise is ours now. They will be ours, but the fulfillment of them is not yet. And so that's what we Jesus is kind of encouraging them to keep in mind. And, uh, and, and then we won't know then when that kingdom will be restored. That kingdom will finally be restored when Jesus comes back, but we won't know when that will be. But he does say, you will receive power, though, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what will that power be? And this is what we're going to touch on some more tomorrow, especially with, with the Gospel of Luke. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What is that power? That power is the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. The Holy Spirit given to the church, that the church would be the witness to the Christ who has died for our sins, the cause of our own death, sin. He has taken that upon himself, and he has been raised overcoming that, that we would know that we have eternal life by that forgiveness. And that uh, that church is the witness. These apostles are the witnesses. Uh, we see that this sort of is, I'm going to talk again more about that tomorrow, this institution of the off, what we call the office of the ministry, sending of, of uh, nowadays what we would call pastors, per, per, perhaps. Um, sending them in that power in the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. And as I said, I, I, I did make the point that is the, the power of the church altogether. That's uh, it's not just just pastors, but but it's seen in a, in a particular way there. But as I continue, uh, verse nine. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took them out of their sight. You know, so here Jesus is is, a, is raised. He ascends, and and look at that word. And a cloud took him out of their sight. Now we often think of um, we think of clouds and just think of well, he went up into the sky. Right, and and so Jesus went into this place that is the right hand of the Father, and we're going to talk more about this. But uh, but that isn't an actual location; it's a position of authority. 
and we, we should understand that. Uh, so when we see that cloud, it isn't certainly don't think it's just like Jesus is floating around in the atmosphere uh, or floating around in space. Uh, no, we, we understand that, um, that that cloud, think about when you see a cloud in the Old Testament. You see that when Moses frees the people, the, the Israelites out of Egypt, and, and who leads them in the wilderness? Well, the Lord does, and how does he do it? Well, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. This cloud is Jesus going into the presence of God. That cloud there with the Israelites, the presence of God, and Jesus in the presence of God as well. Uh, and, and we'll also see, we're going to make some more connections with this um, this ascension. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that, I mean, with... Uh, uh, with, with Psalm 110, what that means, and then uh, and comparing it to Elijah and his ascension in, in 2 Kings. That'll be, be later in the week. Uh, continuing then, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Uh, these two men uh, r- makes us think of the resurrection in Luke. In, in that re- the resurrection, you have two men there at the tomb as well. Kind of this, this whole thing being one act of God, the, the, the conception, the, the incarnation, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, all one act of God, even his return. It's all one thing. It's all kind of conflated into this one act. That's why it can be so hard when we read the, the whole of the scriptures to know whether this is talking about the time of Jesus' first coming or his second coming. That often gets confused. That's a, a lot of the trouble when we speak about the restoration of the kingdom and that sort of thing it comes from that. Um, but these two men standing there, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? So why are you looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. And I love that insight. I remember growing up, I, I always was afraid that when Jesus returned, I wouldn't know that it was him. You know, the first coming, you see all these people who didn't know it was him. Uh, what if he came in that same way? And I wouldn't know. Well, then I studied this, the, the scriptures, God's word, giving me the comfort of knowing he's coming in a totally different way. He's coming with all of his glory and, and he'll be coming in the heavens. And in Philippians, it tells us at that point, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We won't be able to miss it then. Thanks be to God. We'll, we'll see it. But we... At the same time, want to be prepared, and that preparation is is in repentance, and uh, and so we we seek always to be to be repentant. And as our Lord Jesus is in heaven, He sends us His Holy Spirit in that authority, and uh, and He rules in that that grace of His mercy now, also in His power. And we'll talk more about that. But He sends us that Holy Spirit ruling in His grace, that we would be prepared for that coming again. Amen. Continue by speaking our, the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.